Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Andrew Thornton and the cocaine bear? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, including the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Andrew Carter Thornton II was born in Bourbon County, Kentucky on April 30, 1944. He was raised in Lexington. Andrew's parents owned a thoroughbred horse farm and were well off financially. They also had a high level of status in the community. In 1962, Andrew graduated from a military academy in Tennessee. He attended the University of Kentucky, but dropped out and enlisted in the Army. He was a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division and received a Purple Heart during the U.S. invasion of the Dominican Republic in 1965. Andrew went back to college in 1966, but once again dropped out. In 1968, Andrew became a police officer in Lexington. He returned to college for a third time and graduated in 1971 with a degree in law enforcement. In the early 1970s, Andrew joined the narcotic squad of the Lexington Police Department. During his time there, the squad had a reputation for planting evidence, stealing drugs, selling drugs, and generally being corrupt. They had attracted the attention of the FBI, but nothing ever came of that. At night, Andrew went to school at the University of Kentucky College of Law and graduated in 1976 with a law degree. At some point, while Andrew was still a police officer, he became a member of a criminal organization referred to as The Company. This group had hundreds of members and was involved in the illegal transportation of drugs. In 1977, Andrew resigned from the police department and joined a law practice. He never actually practiced as an attorney, but he was technically a member of the law firm. This was in addition to being a drug smuggler. In 1981, several other members of The Company, including Andrew, were accused of various offenses connected to transporting and distributing marijuana and stealing military weapons from a naval air station in Fresno, California. Items that were stolen included radar equipment from a Sidewinder missile, infrared rifle scopes, a low-light television camera, and a miniature remote-controlled helicopter. Investigators said that the items were going to be traded for drugs in South America. Andrew was charged in connection with flying an aircraft full of marijuana into Kentucky. He pleaded not guilty and then fled. He was arrested in North Carolina and brought back to California. Andrew was released on bail and returned to Kentucky. On February 27, 1982, Andrew was leaving a restaurant in Lexington when he was shot twice in the chest at close range with a 38 caliber pistol. The rounds did not penetrate his bulletproof vest. The authorities suspected Andrew of staging the shooting, as if he was trying to convince the court that he should not be sent to prison, because if he was, he would be murdered. Andrew ended up pleading no contest to a misdemeanor drug charge, and all of the other charges, including felonies, were dropped. He received six months in prison and five years probation. His law license in Kentucky was suspended. Over the next few years, Andrew was suspected of being involved in a number of homicides, including the shooting death of a Florida state's attorney who prosecuted one of Andrew's conspirators, the strangulation death of a witness against Andrew, and the death of a man who told the authorities about Andrew's smuggling activities. This man was found with his throat cut. The authorities would never charge Andrew with any of these murders, but Andrew ended up having his career end anyway. On September 11, 1985, Andrew and another man were transporting drugs in a Cessna 404, which is a twin-engine propeller aircraft. The plane was full of drugs and was flying over Georgia. With the autopilot engaged, Andrew and another man jumped out of the aircraft. Andrew landed on the driveway of a private residence in Knoxville, Tennessee. He was found dead at 8.30 a.m. It's not exactly clear how he died. One theory is that he hit his head when he jumped out of the plane, and was knocked unconscious. When he regained consciousness, he was close to the ground. He deployed his reserve parachute, but it was too late. Another theory is that he was simply carrying too much weight. 
Perhaps a combination of these theories could explain what happened. But either way, Andrew was moving pretty fast when he hit the ground. After the men jumped out, the plane continued for a while. It collided with the ground in Haynesville, North Carolina, about 60 miles away, presumably due to fuel exhaustion. Andrew's possessions at the time of his death attracted some attention, like the items that were found on and near his body. He was wearing a bulletproof vest and Gucci loafers. It's not clear what type of situation Andrew was expecting to encounter on the ground, I guess one that required the safety of body armor combined with the style of high-end shoes. Andrew also had other items, including night vision goggles, a 9mm pistol, a 22 caliber pistol, two knives, $4,500 in cash, gold coins, a compass, a key to the airplane, food, vitamins, an altimeter, a membership card to the Miami Jockey Club, and two driver's licenses, one using his real name and one using the name Andrew Bourbon, probably inspired by Bourbon County, Kentucky. As far as the source of the significant weight, which may have caused him problems, Andrew had a duffel bag that contained about 70 pounds of cocaine. Many people die from cocaine because, figuratively speaking, they cannot let go of the drug. Andrew may have died because he literally could not let go of the drug. The other man who jumped out of the aircraft survived and made his escape he was never charged with any crime. In December 1985, three months after Andrew's death, narcotics investigators found plastic bags of cocaine on a hillside in Fannin County, Georgia, about 80 miles north of Atlanta. They noticed that the packages had been ripped open. Next to the bags, they found the remains of a 150-pound black bear. The authorities believed that the bear had consumed several pounds of cocaine. Later, an autopsy report indicated that the bear had about three or four grams of cocaine in its system, which was enough to kill it. The death of this innocent bear inspired a 2023 movie titled Cocaine Bear. To say this movie is a highly fictionalized account would be an understatement. The only similarity between the movie and reality is a bear that consumed cocaine. In the movie, the cocaine bear survives and goes on a rampage in Georgia, Several people, including tourists, police officers, and criminals, battle the raging bear in a forest. The man who wrote the screenplay for the movie said that it was fun to reimagine the bear's story. I guess it was, considering what happened to the bear was not exactly humorous or uplifting. A bear ate cocaine, suffered horribly for about 45 minutes, then died. That's all there was to the original story. The director, Elizabeth Banks, claimed that the bear was given a redemption story. I'm not sure she understands the meaning of the word redemption. The bear had not been accused of any crime. It was the victim in this case. A movie featuring a redemption story would have been titled Cocaine Andrew. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few items that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. Andrew Thornton had an unusual personality. He was sensation-seeking, overconfident, immature, reckless, and paranoid. He considered himself to be disciplined, spiritual, philosophical, and a loyal warrior who desired vengeance. Andrew may have engaged in illegal activities as a police officer, probably to make the job more exciting, but he still became bored with it. This is why he finally quit. Andrew made a number of extraordinary claims. He said he was a master of martial arts, once killed a German shepherd with his bare hands, and was a freelance military advisor. Andrew prided himself on his tenacity to release his parachute at a low altitude. Skydivers are known for overcoming fear, but Andrew did not seem to have any fear at all. People described Andrew as having a 007 paramilitary-type personality, a person who always walked on the edge, and a little boy who never grew up. Andrew was low in openness to experience. His thinking was concrete, and he was not creative. Low in conscientiousness, he was definitely not cautious, high in extroversion, especially the sensation-seeking facet. He had low agreeableness. He may have murdered several people, but even if he didn't, he definitely sought out conflict. And he had mid-level neuroticism. He had no depression or anxiety, but he could not resist temptation, and he had a tendency to become angry. Item number two, Andrew married in 1968 and divorced in 1970. He resented having a wife he thought of himself as a man of adventure, 
who should not be tied down or restricted in any way. His ex-wife said that the more he became like a James Bond character, the more difficulty she had relating to him. It sounds like Andrew was becoming increasingly lost in his secret adventure fantasy. Item number three. Andrew was a survivalist and doomsday prepper. He stockpiled freeze-dried foods, gold coins, weapons, camouflage fatigues, and body armor. He owned a farm where he may have operated a guerrilla warfare training camp for mercenaries. The farm had a barracks and trenches. Andrew eagerly looked forward to the potential of Armageddon. He thought nuclear war was on the way, and he just couldn't wait. Many people who prepare for the end times do so out of fear and paranoia. Andrew was paranoid, but he did not seem like the type of person who would be that afraid. There's a sense that he prepared for the apocalypse because he was excited about the adventure. He wanted it to happen so he could use all his weapons and skills. His only fear was not being ready to maximize his fun value when the apocalypse occurred. Andrew is like a character in a zombie apocalypse movie who initially has success, but then dies because he gets carried away, attacking the undead. Item number four. Andrew was a big fan of inspirational quotes. Here are two examples that capture his personality fairly well. The first one, quote, There's only one tactical principle not subject to change. It is to inflict the maximum amount of wounds, death, and destruction on the enemy in the minimum amount of time, unquote. I think this quote highlights Andrew's desire for revenge as well as his impatience. It's not good enough to get revenge. A person must do it quickly. The second one, quote, Man can overcome any obstacle if he knows in his heart that he must and in his mind that he shall, unquote. Unfortunately for Andrew, there was one obstacle he could not overcome, gravity. Item number five, I talked before about the theories as to what caused Andrew's death. It appears as though something went wrong during his jump. Regardless of what actually killed him, the decision to jump out of the aircraft started the fatal sequence of events. Why did Andrew decide to leave the aircraft as it was flying? Most people who are experienced with aviation find that exiting an aircraft is safest after it landed. One theory is that Andrew spotted another aircraft and believed it was following him. Again, he was paranoid, therefore this is a plausible explanation. Andrew knew that he was going to lose the plane, but he did not want to give up the cocaine. This cost Andrew his life, but he was not his final victim. Rather, there was one more, the cocaine bear. This brings me to item number six. A place in Lexington called the Kentucky Fun Mall claims that they have the cocaine bear. It was stuffed by a taxidermist and put on display. I find it very difficult to believe that they have the actual cocaine bear. Investigators describe the bear as decomposed. In addition, I imagine that the investigators would have destroyed the remains after testing the bear for cocaine. There's no way to know for sure, but again, I suspect that that is not the actual cocaine bear. Moving to my final item, number seven, what do I think of the concept behind the movie Cocaine Bear? I'm a fan of creativity. It's a legitimate premise for a horror movie to have a bear on cocaine wiping people out, but it only has a weak connection to the actual cocaine bear story. Saying the movie was inspired by the bear is kind of like saying Friday the 13th was inspired by a hockey game, or the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was inspired by a gardener who lost control of a weed whacker. If the producers of the Cocaine Bear movie really wanted to make it scary, they should have featured the bear's struggle to break the cocaine addiction. They could have had the bear go to psychotherapy, end up hospitalized a few times, maybe spend some time in jail for illegally importing honey to trade for cocaine. Despite this, the movie does warn of the dangers of cocaine in an unforgettable and graphic way. So perhaps it's prudent to bear in mind that the film tries to bear witness to how people who use cocaine have a cross to bear. Those are my thoughts on Andrew Thornton and the cocaine bear. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.